Welcome back to a new episode of Creators in Motion by Portrait Displays. In this installment, I had the pleasure of interviewing renowned producer and director Christine Fugate. Christine's impressive career spans unscripted programming and narrative features that have captivated audiences around the globe. She has produced content for major networks like Discovery, VH1, Disney, a e Sundance, Travel Channel, PBS, and HBO. Starting in feature films, Christine served as Senior VP of Creative Affairs at Pacific Rim, but her insatiable passion for storytelling led her to documentary filmmaking, where she established herself as one of showbiz's top 100 directors. Beyond her directorial achievements, Christine's insightful interviewing skills have brought her face-to-face with some of Hollywood's biggest stars, from Johnny Depp to Tom Hanks, Julie Andrews, and Anne Hathaway. Join us in this episode of Creators in Motion as we delve into Christine Fugate's remarkable journey, Discover her unique approach to storytelling, her remarkable achievements in the world of film and television, and her commitment to nurturing the future of the industry. My name's Christine Fugate. I'm from Kentucky, and I always wanted to be a director from about the time I was 16 years old. Mm-hmm. A director and writer, I was very clear that I wanted to do both. And I've been making films for probably 30 years, but I started out actually doing it as a child actor. I did a lot of acting and uh, fell in love with that and then was really gonna go into the theater, but ended up in film. Mm -hmm. And I have done a lot of acting in theater, and I've been in one movie where I played a Thai nun in Thailand. Yeah, that's so great, because that actually leads me into my next question, which is, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about your childhood. Um, When did you know you wanted to work in film? Was that a pivotal moment for you? And were you always creative as a child and drawn to the arts? I was always a creative child. Um, I had an imaginary friend. I was an only child for a long time. And so I would either play with my imaginary friend or I would go around the neighborhood and collect stories. Mm -hmm. I loved hanging out in other people's houses. I was just probably one of those annoying kids that always went everywhere. And my family was very um, formal and we would eat dinner at 6.30 at night with one protein and two vegetables. And all my friends ate dinner at four, 4.30 with macaroni, and, macaroni salad and jello in front of the TV. So I really was very upset about that. So I tried to have dinner with other families as much as possible. But I did become very good at collecting stories and listening to people's stories. And that became a favorite part of my life is just hearing and looking at other people's photo albums. Since I was like eight years old, I would go into a house and be like, can I look at your photos? Can I hear your stories? So I was always a good listener, always loved stories, Um, did a lot of writing when I was young, and I basically kept a journal from the time I could write. Mm. And I have boxes of journals that I've written my whole life. Do you keep a journal today? I'm a little bit weak on it right now, I have to say, for keeping a journal. Uh, I need to get back into it. I think it's because I see now all the boxes of journals I have. I'm like, what am I going to do with these? But I don't know. I don't think you really, I don't think you do a journal to keep anything, to do anything with them. I think it's important as a creative person to always just be writing down ideas and just also kind of getting the madness out onto Mm -hmm. paper. I've always said that I live in two different worlds. I live in reality and then I live in my own story world. And I think when I journal more, I'm able to be more present in reality. That's so interesting. Yeah, so as a child, you were always collecting stories and listening to other people. Mm -hmm. When did you realize that could be something more than just stories you wrote about in your journal or, or stories you kept in your head? When did you realize that could apply to film too? I think that around the time I remember my family would always go to Kitty Hawk and Nags Head in North Carolina, near where Outer Banks, the TV show, takes place. And um, we would rent a house out there. And I remember one time I was 16 years old and my parents and I had been discussing my future. And I 
was sitting there and I just had this very clear moment that I want to be a writer and a director. Mm. And I thought I will stick to my guns no matter what. Uh, my mom was a social worker and my father was a math professor and my mom really wanted me to go into social work. I think because you could get a good job and she thought that I would also be good because I like listening to other people's stories. But that wasn't where I wanted to go. I loved theater in high school. I had an amazing drama teacher. And then when I got into college, I asked my parents to study acting at Tulane and they said no. And so I studied history, which is another form of storytelling. And I did some acting in college. And then when I graduated, I traveled around the world for two years. Mm -hmm. And then when I came back, I realized I'm gonna do what I want. And I went to graduate school for film. What was your parents' reaction to that? To you definitively saying, I'm gonna do that. I'm a director and I wanna work in film. How did they react to that? My parents were not supportive at all. Mm. Yeah. So when I went to graduate school, I ended up getting a scholarship because my parents were not gonna give me any money. And I got a scholarship. Uh, the government has this weird thing left over, I think from the Vietnam War, that they'll pay for people, two people to study every Southeast Asian language. So I got a scholarship to study Thai. And I could go to Cornell or University of Hawaii. So I chose to go to Hawaii. They were just starting to build their film program at the time. And so I had to study Thai every day. I studied four hours a day. It was incredibly difficult for me, uh, but I ended up doing it anyway. And I learned how to do an anthropological study first, which was really great for how I later went into documentaries. And then I wrote my paper, my thesis paper, on the portrayal of women in Thai film. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up going and living in Thailand and working in the Thai film industry there. And that's where I first started directing narrative films. Mm -hmm. So I was directing, I directed English speaking characters and it often was a large part of a film. Mm -hmm. So Why specifically Thai when you could have chosen any language in Asia for that scholarship? Was there something specific about Thai that made you choose that? When I traveled around the world for almost two years after I graduated from college, I actually worked my way around the world. I didn't, I had a thousand dollars that I had gotten from my grandmother. I bought around the world, and my parents bought me a around the world plane ticket. So I worked in Australia a lot and saved money, and I was able to travel through China, all through Asia. And when I landed in Thailand, I just felt like I had been there before. I fell in love with the country. And I stayed there as long as I could. I even got my visa extended across the border into Malaysia, where I was offered $10,000 for my passport. Oh my gosh. And I thought, oh my God, that's a lot of money. <laughs> and then I was like, I could also go to jail. So I think I'll say no and just renew my passport and head back to Thailand. <laughs> so I lived there. I went back to Hawaii. I graduated with my master's. And then I got a phone call and they said, can you please come work back in the Thai industry? Mm. So I went and worked there for a long time until Barbie Schroeder, mm -hmm. who's a French director, came there with some American producers. He was looking to make a movie with Christine Lottie and Mickey Rourke. And so he wanted to hire me to help him make that film. But at the time I got dengue fever. So I went back to Kentucky to heal, ended up getting in touch with Barbie and I moved out to LA to work with him and Sony. I was actually gonna ask you about this. So working with Barbe, how do you think that impacted you? Like obviously being such a young filmmaker and getting to work with such a prominent director so early on in your career? I loved the fact that he, he had such a European sensibility. He had done narrative and documentary. And I think that's where I really learned that it's okay to be a hybrid. Mm -hmm. He did Coco the Talking Gorilla. He did Idi Amin Dada which is this just crazy portrait on uh, Idi Amin. But he also had done a lot of French films and he did Single White Female, he did Barfly, Reversal of Fortune. And when I started working for him, he had just been nominated for an Academy Award. So it was really exciting to be amongst all of that at the time. Yeah. And for him, storytelling was just, it didn't matter which genre you were in. And he taught me a lot about structure and that you use that kind of structure in whatever film you're telling. Mm -hmm. I, it, there's, there, he didn't really draw a line between it. 
he believed in all forms of it. And I think he was an incredible mentor to me. And he also knew that I knew how to budget smaller films, but not big budget films. So he sent me to UCLA Extension where I studied under a famous uh, UPM and learned how to do a large scale multi-million dollar budget. And that came, that came in very handy. Yeah, so before working with him, did you think you had to pick either narrative or documentary? Were you leaning towards one over the other? Well, I had been working in narrative in Thailand and reading scripts, working for Five Star Productions, and I thought narrative was the way to go. I, I had a family friend that was in television at the time, and I went and met with him at Raleigh Studios, and he said to me, don't go into TV because there's no crossover between, at the time there was no crossover between TV and film. Mm -hmm. He was doing a sitcom with Patti LaBelle, and he said, if you go this, he said, I keep trying to get into film and I can't, so I recommend that you stay in film. Mm -hmm. So now we see that it's completely different with the limited series, but at the time it was really one or the other, so I chose film. Mm -hmm. And I did some short films. I never directed a feature film in the States. I became much more kind of enthralled with the studio executive the world of studio executives. So I did development for a while at Pacific Rim Productions at Warner Brothers after I worked for Barbe. And then I was promoted to senior VP of Creative Affairs where we did the, I oversaw all the casting, the development of projects. And we did Natural Causes, which was on HBO. And then we were about to do another film when it turned out that the head of the company embezzled all the money. I received a phone call from our investors and he took the money. And so they said, if you'll close down the office, we'll give you all of the equipment, which at the time it was expensive to have computers and fax machines and printers and we had high-end equipment. Mm -hmm. So I closed down the office for them and that's when I started my own company, Cafe Sisters Productions. Wow, and that was the end of your run as a studio executive, right? That was the end. Do you think you learned anything from that time that you still use in your filmmaking today or that helps you run your company? I learned so much because I read probably 20 scripts a week. Mm. I would go home with a weekend for the weekend with at least 10 scripts in hand and often a couple of books. I could read a script in 50 minutes. Wow. Which and I could read it well. Mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't sit down and write coverage. We had people that did coverage, but I could read it. Uh, I also read books, and so I really learned a lot about what makes a good story, what makes good material. We had actors come in and read them. I also studied, when I was working for Barbe, I studied directing at the Beverly Hills Playhouse, and there were two directors allowed for every group of actors, mm -hmm. and I learned so much from watching the actors put up the scenes. My teacher at the time became Jeffrey Tambor, and I was in the class with like Jenna Elfman and Vonnie Rabisi and the Soup Nazi from Seinfeld and uh, Corbin Burnson and Corbin Burnson's brother. I'm trying to think of who else. There were some other people who worked for Nicole Kidman and mm -hmm. it was kind of a very Hollywood experience, but more than anything, I learned a lot about directing yeah. and how to rehearse and work with actors. Mm -hmm. and. I learned the respect for actors that we need to have in order to make that relationship work. Having that background in theater from high school and college, did that ever make you tempted to kind of dip your toe back into acting when you were at the Beverly Hills Playhouse? I was tempted to go back to acting and I still am sometimes. I, am, I think I think when I'm 80, mm -hmm. maybe I'll go back into it. I do love acting. I love going into a different world. Do you think having that background in acting kind of helps when you're thinking about the film from that directorial perspective? Do you think it benefits your relationship with the actors to have your own background in acting? Do you think that helps you understand where they're coming from? Absolutely helps me to know as an actor for a director and also teaching directing and teaching writing. Right now I'm teaching thesis development. I'm talking to them about what is the want and how is the actor gonna play that? Mm -hmm. You have to figure out how are you gonna actually play that as an actor 
And I think directors need to think like that more. Mm -hmm. Because to me, directing is so much more than choosing the right shot. It's about getting an authentic performance. Absolutely, yeah. No, I think that's a great perspective. Do you ever have your directors, students at Chapman University practice a little improv or acting to help them the same way it helped you? So um, when, when I decided to become a parent, mm -hmm. I knew that I couldn't work full time. I was actually I was actually on the road with Kiss making a show for MTV about them and pregnant my doctor said you can't travel much longer and I went and interviewed to do Sweet Home Alabama which I was really excited about doing that movie because I'm from the south but it was just too much for me um, I was hiding my pregnancy at the time and it was not going to be able to be hidden that much longer so I decided, I think maybe I should get into teaching for a little bit, something I can do part-time but still stay present. And so I started teaching at USC. I have quite a few friends that teach there and I really enjoyed it. I taught with a director of photography, mm -hmm. directing. And then we decided to move down to Orange County and to Laguna Beach. And that's when I looked at Chapman University and I loved the studio there and the students. And so I started teaching directing mm -hmm. at Chapman. Mm -hmm. And I really was, felt it was so important to work in doing scenes and improv. And I remember the first room that we were given was not the right kind of room. It was a production design room where they had all these drafting tables. So I had all the actors doing scenes out in the hallways and around the drafting tables. And so eventually I think they realized she needs a lot of space, so they gave me bigger rooms. Sounds like you do a lot of improv with your students. Is that something you emphasize, like that director-actor relationship? When I teach directing, I think it's important to do improv. I think it's important for... The thing I learned most, I think, at the Beverly Hills Playhouse is that you will be a better director if you also act. And even though I had done a lot of acting and I had been in a movie, I did not really want to get on stage and put up a scene in front of all these professional actors. But they made me do the scene from When Harry Met Sally. We did the scene and we did it on a park bench and it was hard to do. I was embarrassed. I was nervous. They give you a critique afterwards. And it was hard for me to see myself, but Milton Katsalas was teaching at the time as his playhouse. And he said that I became, the next scene that I put about that I directed, he said I was a better director, that the actors gave better performances than they had before. Mm -hmm. And that's when I really learned that it is so important that directors improv and experience acting. And so I'm doing it now more than ever in my classes. Is that something you keep up personally? Are you still acting or, or doing improv in your free time? I have been wanting to join an improv group. I've also looked into taking classes at South Coast Rep because I think it's important as a teacher and a director to be involved in that. At this time, I, I don't have the time to do it mm -hmm. because I've been in the middle of making films. I also am in the process of writing a book and I write short stories as a hobby. <laughs> mm -hmm. I was actually just gonna ask you about that. I know you talked about the importance of acting alongside directing, but you write too. How do you maintain that balance to you know, have time to write, direct, act? Is that all an important part of your creative process? I l love writing short stories because you can write what the characters are thinking in their heads. And that is one of the things that keeps me sharp about also writing screenplays, which I do also. You, if you start writing what the, if the character starts actually saying what they're thinking, then that's expositional. And that's something that we just can't do in screenplays. And, but you can do it in a short story. And so I often go way deep into what the character is thinking when I write short stories. And I just find it's a good place to say, I wanna tell the story about this woman who is thinking about her husband being unfaithful and what that means to her. And that's something I can write a short story about mm -hmm. as opposed to a screenplay. Where do you find the inspiration for those short stories? Or not just the stories, but also for your documentaries as well? The inspiration that I used to get, try to guess inspiration. What do people wanna see? Mm -hmm. What's popular right now? And I finally learned that what is going to be popular is what interests me. It may not be 
a blockbuster, but the only way that I can stay with the project is if it interests me. And I've definitely started on projects that don't have my full interest and they don't end up going anywhere, How inevitably. How do you find what interests you? It sounds like since your childhood, you've just been a natural listener and a natural storyteller. How do you pick what's interesting to you? And then like from that, how do you pick what do you think will be interesting to other people and what's good enough to make a film out of? Well, my latest film, Queen Maria, I had finished a film and had had a couple of short stories also published. And I was at my daughter's football game, homecoming football game, where she was dancing. And Maria, who I had met briefly through on the soccer field, her sister played soccer with my daughter. She won homecoming queen and she dropped to her knees with gratitude. She has a rare genetic condition that manifests itself in different ways. And she was so grateful to be chosen as homecoming queen. And I turned around and looked and a whole stance, they were on their feet, clapping and crying. And I looked around, we were all crying. And I thought, there's something incredible about this woman. I need to understand who she is and, and how she touches people. Yeah. How does somebody touch that many people? And so I, it took me about six months to gain access and trust with a family, which is a very important part of documentaries. People think it's not the news. You can't just start filming somebody and holding a camera up to their face. They're not gonna reveal who they really are. So I had to gain the trust and access of the family just by spending time with them, talking about what I wanted to do, talking about why this would be important. And eventually I was able to start filming them. Mm -hmm. And I filmed for four years and I was almost done and then COVID hit. And I was missing one more scene of Maria working at a um, senior home. And as we know with COVID, the senior homes closed, filming stopped. Mm -hmm. I tried a couple of times of a deep sanitation of my equipment and uh, I have some funny photos, but it didn't work. Yeah. Giving them the equipment, talking on the phone, this is how you do it. Yeah. It didn't really work out. So I just had to wait until we were able to start filming again. I'm glad you brought up Queen Maria. Could you tell for people watching who don't know anything about that, just a little bit about the movie, kind of some background, and also what your creative process was? Queen Maria follows an Asian American uh, woman as she, she was born with Williams syndrome, which is a rare genetic condition, and it follows her and her boyfriend and best friend as they graduate from high school and move into adulthood. And it's really a story about hope and inspiration and the theme that the love of our family and friends is what sustains us through difficult times. And it started out as a very political piece. It was when Betsy DeVos was a secretary of education working for Donald Trump, and she was going to get rid of the Disabilities Act, which provides free education for children with disabilities in, in the high school and elementary system. And I thought, this is unacceptable. They were trying to take it to a voucher program. And so I started making this film because of how special Maria was, but to also show how impactful her high school education had been on who she was at that moment when she won. And then Betsy DeVos came out against the Special Olympics and that just, Trump had to shut her down to be quiet. And that's when I had to pivot because I had already shot over a year of footage. And so if you look at my trailer, a sizzle reel, before I'd finished, it is very different, very different than it is now. And so I pivoted to a more personal film of what is she like? What are her friends? What are the struggles they go through? And you see that she goes through the struggles that we all go through. She has a boyfriend, they break up, she has friend dramas, you know, and to me it was important to show that part. There also still is the political aspect of when our youth with disabilities graduate. The system wants to put them as a checkout person at Ralph, a uh, bagging person at Ralph's or 
at the fitting room at Kohl's. I mean, these are not acceptable jobs for most people. And you see the programs that Maria has put into, and it's something that I'll be working for changing, hopefully towards changing with an impact program of gaining more awareness and saying more of what can we do mm-hmm. with our youth who have excellent education. They need to be doing more than that. Yeah, you've talked a little bit about the role of this film to enact political change and as a political statement. What specifically about the medium of film do you think makes it such a good device for enacting change? I think it's very difficult to make a film that sparks action. And it's something that I've learned, I think when I was younger, I was much more idealistic, like every film has to. And I finally realized it's okay if a film entertains, it doesn't have to move everybody to political action. But I do hope that this at least makes people think about it and about what are the opportunities available. And I think the first film that I made that actually had impact was Tobacco Blues. And it was about tobacco farmers. And it was during a time when tobacco farmers were being blamed for people smoking which is ridiculous is yes, you grow the tobacco doesn't mean that you're shoving it into somebody's mouth to smoke. And so farmers were not getting good benefits at the time when ironically, many of the tobacco farmers are the farmers who started the organic food movement because they were making, they, they could tell that tobacco was going to be moved out of the country. And it is, it's now farmed in, in Africa where they pay people a dollar a day for a wage. And also in South America, they, they knew that way before we did. So they, they knew they had to pivot into a new business. And many of them started doing organic food. I remember I tried an organic strawberry for the first time. And people just don't realize that that is a lot of how it happened. But a lot of the farmers went to the government and said, capitalism, which is alive and well and should be in our country, is moving our industry overseas and what are we going to do? And so Senator Henry Waxman called us and asked if we could have a copy of the film. And so they started showing it around Washington, D.C. And that's when we received the call that President Clinton was going to be watching it on Air Force One as he flew down to meet with some farmers in rural Kentucky. So the Democratic Party called and asked us to drive one of his big supporters to meet him. And we did, and we got to meet him. And he thanked us twice for making the film, which was a really powerful moment for us. Because as filmmakers, you often just kind of toil away in obscurity and, you know, go to some film festivals and then it's on television. But to be able to meet the President of the United States and have him thank us for making the film and, and to know that it was actually used to advocate for farmers' rights was, I think, opened our eyes to see that it can make a difference. That's amazing, not only with that, but that Queen Maria got into slam dance. I know so many filmmakers like dream of getting into slam dance and having such a successful festival run. What do you think it is about your style of directing that's making such an impact? Well, I think that sometimes it's luck. The first documentary I made, The Southern Sex, was about the myth that I was raised with, if you're beautiful and get married, you'll be happy the rest of your life. And that film did very well, played in a lot of festivals and was on public television a lot. And then I went to go make my second film called Mother Love, which was about Appalachian mothers. And we looked at uh, the spectrum from uh, poverty welfare mom up to uh, the family that lived next door to the governor of Kentucky. And interestingly enough, we found the smaller your house is, probably the closer your family will be, which was interesting. And I also learned a different aspect of Walmart, but that's another story. And I thought, oh, this movie is going to have such a great impact on mothers and daughters and how people view welfare moms and Appalachian moms. One won one award was on PBS, but it didn't have any of the impact that I wanted it to. And I thought, I don't know, am I doing the right thing? Am I heading down the right path of trying to tell people's, my job, my mission statement has always been to tell stories of 
be people who can't tell their own stories in a film, in the genre of film. And just when I was feeling at my lowest, we received a phone call that we had received funding for Tobacco Blues. And that's when we decided to, we cast four farmers and we followed them through a full cycle of tobacco. And that's then when it had its political impact on our government and on funding and we got to meet the president. And I think that that spurred us forward to the next one. And for me, one of the most important parts, ironically, has always been to create a connection with the person that I'm interviewing and to interview them in, a, in an authentic and non-manipulative manner. And also, I've always tried to keep the strongest ethical code in the editing room. And sometimes we do have to edit and take people's words and mix them up. But as long as I'm always staying with what they meant to say or what I wanted them to say, then I felt then it's been okay to do. The other thing is to actually be as much as possible a fly on the wall, which is very hard but to get the cinema verite and actually try to show scenes of what their life is like. And then it's the mix of editing them and how do you put it together and tell a story. And I finally have learned that the only way that I can know if something works is my intuition. Because when I made a film about a woman who went from being a housewife to an international adult film star, I did a, we had a lot of investors and we did a lot of test testing with audiences. And there was a scene where she has a um, implants removed and changed for a smaller size. And it's a very graphic operation. And it's kind of before we had all of the operations that were on TV and some of the people wrote down on their comment cards or expressed in the discussion that, it, that they found it very disturbing that they wanted the surgery scenes to be shorter. And that's when I said, well, that's good. Now I'm going to make them longer because I wanted it to be disturbing. So I, I found that I, I'm the only barometer and sometimes I've hit it and sometimes I haven't hit it as hard. So. I just think it's a matter of, of trial and error. That's amazing. I'm learning so much from you. That's fantastic. Do you have advice for first time documentary filmmakers who, I mean, you can clearly see Maria is so close to you and open with the camera because of that trust you've built with her. Can you talk about that process of not only casting, but moving towards filmmaking with your subject and, and how you prepare them for that? I think the secret to success of gaining the trust of your subject is almost the same thing as a secret to success of being a good director and actor, and that's listening. A lot of directors step in, they have their own agenda, and they're not willing to listen to what people are saying. And I think ever since I've been little, I've been a good listener. And if you aren't a good listener, then you need to learn how to become one. I've also always been incredibly observant of other people's behavior and probably a little bit too nosy um, staring at people when they're doing things, just always curious as to what's happening. But I do think that trust and access are huge and spending the time that's needed. And if you feel like you don't have the time, then maybe you're not doing the right film or maybe that's not the right character. I've definitely had characters where I realized I wasn't going to get the trust and the access and I've had to move on from them. I've realized they're only going to give one party line. Or I've also seen sometimes other sides of people that I don't necessarily want to document. I'm not interested in making people look bad. I'm interested in humanizing people. And I've definitely started down some projects where I've realized that the intentions of the people were not possibly the purest. Have you ever had to deal with subjects that you can tell are lying or being dishonest on camera? Absolutely, I've mm -hmm. dealt with lying subjects. And how do you work with that? I think that secrets and lies make incredible narrative films and then it's actually important. I think that if your character says a line on screen, for the most part, it needs to be a lie 
or a part of a lie for it to really be interesting or to have subtext. But in a documentary, I mean, I think we all lie every day. There's every kind of level of lies. So some lying doesn't bother me in the documentary, but when I can tell that they're going to consistently live in those lies, I'm not interested. Those are not the kind of films that I want to make. There's other people who want to make those kinds of films, but that's not me. Mm -hmm. And also the other thing I've learned is that when you make a film, you're going to be living with it for at least a year, probably two to three. My producer and I used to make films with the Cafe Sisters. We had a one year maximum because we met filmmakers who worked for 10 years on a film. And we said, that's not going to be us. We're going to make a film every year. We're going to keep it within a year. And we, we did pretty well for a while until we hit the girl next door. And that took two years, but I'm just, it's just not the stories that I want to tell. Mm -hmm. And so I did begin head down the path of a film where the people were incredibly materialistic, narcissistic, self-absorbed. And that was not where I wanted to live for a year to two. Now that said, I did try to gain access to some interesting cultures that might have had some lies, but they were passionate about their goals. And that was one is the Michigan militia. And that was before January 6th and before a lot of it was exposed. But I knew that there was a story there. And through some anti-vaxxers in Texas, I gained access to them and was looking to go and spend time and make a documentary series there but they researched my name and they said I was funded by Obama, which I wish I was funded by Obama, but I'm not. But I did happen to give some money to Obama's campaign and I think that that stopped that. Although my producer said she would refuse to work on it because she was terrified for her life. So, but I wasn't. How do you set boundaries? Obviously when you're making a documentary about people, like you said, you're with them for a year, sometimes more. It just seems hard to imagine that sometimes those heavy topics that you're dealing with don't bleed into your own life. How do you like protect your own sanity and your mental health? I'm definitely affected by the, the cultures that I've lived in. And I think that, again, it kind of comes back to the same thing I've always liked about acting and directing is that narrative films is that you take yourself into another world. You live in another world. And it's one of my favorite things about documentaries is that you live in another world, except you don't know what's gonna happen the next day. Every day is a new day. And when I was making a film in the adult film industry, it was a, the people could not be nicer. The, they're filmmakers. Every day they make a film, they just happen to cover up the windows. They just happen to worry about the police are going to stop by and shut down their filming. And there was just something dark for me about filming the watching the filming of an in, such an intimate act as sex. And my film wasn't about that. It was about what does it do to a woman who is an adult film star. So if I did happen to film her when she was doing having sex, then there would be a light pole blocking it or wasn't explicit uh, it, per se, but I was on the set and I, I found it very dark. Mm -hmm. And after two years, I was in a sort of dark depression. I didn't want anybody to touch me. And I felt it had affected me and I had to spend some time crawling out of that. Oh. So I uh, have been affected by it. And then making a film in the space of disability, I learned so much. I also made mistakes, learning about the language, how you're supposed to speak about it. I just didn't know. I, I learned so much. And you, you learn about a lot of sad stories too. And I think if you're gonna be a good filmmaker and a good storyteller, you have to be empathetic and you have to have a heart that's willing to open. And so you're gonna feel the good and you're gonna feel the bad. Yeah, that makes sense. I feel like there's no way to separate your own personal life from a movie when you're that involved. 
Kind of pivoting here to talk about your film, The Southern Sex, that was really using some pioneering documentary techniques, especially for the time. Um, and I know from when we've talked independently, you faced some backlash in the documentary community. Could you talk a little bit more about what those techniques were and then what the backlash you faced was? When I made The Southern Sex, I had never made a documentary before. I had watched a lot of them, but I had been working in the narrative film industry. And I also had several friends who were ex experimental filmmakers in San Francisco. They used to laugh at me. They said I sold out because I lived in Los Angeles and they were making real art by living in San Francisco. So I had been exposed to experimental filmmaking. So when I wanted to make The Southern Sex, it was purely my idea that I am tried to be beautiful and I'm not going to get married yet, but I don't see like my life getting any better doing what I was supposed to do as a Southern woman. And I'm really looking at also how are women portrayed in the media. It's always been an interesting topic of mine. So I just had ideas of how I wanted to film it. And I had a mannequin and I put her in a bridesmaid dress that I had and I laid her on a railroad track. And I used an effect like a slow motion stutter that was in the camera because at the time to do effects on your film or video was very expensive. They weren't in the editing programs and it was sealed. It wasn't coming out. And so I put her laying on the track with the sound of the train coming. And I found a piece of music that I loved. I used just different tactics like that and it, it appealed to people who watched films, but other filmmakers gave me a hard time and said documentaries do not have slow motion footage with mannequins on them laying on train tracks. And I was like, well, who says? But that was, I was criticized for it. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, well, I can't change it. It is what it is. And this is what I want to say. Mm -hmm. Being a Southern woman feels like you're laying on a train track and you're about to get hit by a tra train. And in your bridesmaid dress that your best friend from high school made you pay $250 for. And we all look like a bunch of plums rolling down the highway. But anyway, that's how it felt. So I did what I wanted to do. And it was hard. But it was successful. Mm -hmm. And I think that that spurred me forward to do what I wanted to do. So I did some of those techniques in Mother Love. And they didn't quite work as well, although I still like the film. And it played recently at like a retrospect of my work. And I think it, I think it plays better now mm -hmm. that things like this are accepted. A mother, there's a scene in which a mother is watching her daughter walk away in a wedding dress. She's running towards the woods and she turns around and looks, but she's a little girl. That's a, kind of that idea of as the daughter leaves the house, she's the young woman. But I have to say about Mother Love, it was a very impactful film for my filmmaking because I really, for the first time, connected with one of my subjects. And we had spent some time together and we went into the backyard way up in the hill. She lived in basically the hollers of Pikeville. And I was interviewing her just with my director of photography. And she started talking to me about some really intimate subjects. And I just started crying. And you have to cr cry quietly. But, and she was crying. And it was one of the most intimate moments I had ever experienced filming. And I think it changed my life. Mm -hmm. I just fell in love with interviewing people and being able to access that kind of emotion in her and myself. Yeah, and I feel like your film perfectly fits in now. I mean, you see those kind of techniques all the time, like blending narrative film techniques with documentary and, and experimental film. Um, you were really like ahead of your time and a pioneer of the time. Is that something you encourage your students to do is to kind of pave their own path no matter the backlash that they might face? I probably should push my students to, or I probably should encourage my students to push boundaries a bit more. Mm -hmm. I, 
do try to encourage them to go with their gut more because that's the only barometer that we have. Once my producer and I rewrote a grant called The Coffee Clatch, we're like, this is going to make an amazing film. We're going to film, and we made up all this great group of characters, and we're like, we're going to film this group of women having coffee and discussing all these subjects, and it's going to be an intimate portrayal of the relationship between women, the, the modern watering well, if we could say. And we thought, we'll cast the people later. Let's get the money first. Well, we made it to the semifinals, and we're wow, this is amazing. We're so on the zeitgeist. And then we didn't get the money at all. And we were thought, what were we doing? We didn't even know what story we wanted to say. It was a documentary. We're just kind of making it up. Mm -hmm. And that's when I learned, I'm not going to do that anymore. Mm -hmm. We put a lot of time into that grant proposal. I'm going to make films that I want to make. Mm -hmm. And I want to push the boundaries I want to do. Um, but I do have to say, just going back to something that you've said, I don't want to say like I'm avant-garde, but I'm off, I have been ahead of my time with some films and some of that's good and some of it's bad mm -hmm. because I haven't gotten the financial payment that you would get, but I have to help pave the way such that the girl next door, there was no uh, body improvement. I forgot what the show was called, Makeover. So Garth Fisher, I had to talk to him for three months. I sent him my resume, every piece of press that ever came out about me because he would not let me film Stacey Valentine having public sur plastic surgery. Mm -hmm. And eventually he agreed, but I wasn't allowed to go into his operating room and film him because he was afraid something went wrong. And the reason the footage looks so good is that the nurse came out and handed me the camera. I said, you did an incredible job. And she said, well, I wanted to be a photographer, but my parents made me study nursing. So I got very lucky on that. And a year later, he was doing makeover mm -hmm. shows. Yeah, and now you see that everywhere. Even the Kardashians openly filmed their surgery. So that was very ahead of its time, too. To pivot, I want to talk a little bit about your film Grief Becomes Me because that has such a strong visual look with the water. I know you've talked a little bit about in-camera effects and playing around with that. Can you talk about how you start the process of deciding what the visual look of a film is going to be? Well, before we were never allowed to color grade films, documentaries. You could color grade narrative, but you were not allowed to color grade a documentary because it was considered manipulative even though I had already manipulated footage, starting with my career in the Southern sex. But with Grief Becomes Me it was based on a poet who had lost her husband to a bicycle accident. He'd been hit by a methadone addict. And when it happened, she actually woke up at that exact moment. And she wrote a book of poetry called Grief Becomes Me. And I read it. I actually saw her speak at a literary event. And I said to her, I went right up to her and I said, I'm gonna make movies about your poems. And she laughed and said, nobody ever says that to a poet. And I actually got in touch with her and I started making narrative shorts based on her poetry. And they started playing well in festivals. And then I eventually ended up making a documentary that wrapped all of them together. But for Grief Becomes Me and for Quintana Roo, a couple of her films, I had these dreams where I could see the colors and they were a stripe of blue and like a stripe of uh, sand or white and then almost like another stripe of blue. And I saw her at the ocean with these colors. And so I talked to my director of photography about it and we had to shoot it that way. And strangely enough, that's I mean, we set the shot up to look like that, but that's how it filmed were the colors that we got. We shot at the peninsula in Long Beach where she lived. And I was able to achieve the colors that I wanted without any manipulation or color grading, which if I could go back and do it again, I'm sure could make it look even more beautiful. Uh, and, and another strange thing happened. I said to her, I feel that you need to walk into the water and she said, it's very strange that you say that because my friends had me on suicide watch. My husband died and I, they were worried I was going to walk into the water so they would 
they would stand and watch me. And that actually didn't make the film, Walking Along the Water did. But color has always been very important to me. Even starting with the Southern Sex, I said to Sandy Chandler, who was my director of photography for many years, I want the film highly saturated. I want the colors strong. I want the purple bridesmaid dress strong on those train tracks. I don't want it washed out. I want the poet with an umbrella in the middle of a field. I want the black of her dress and her umbrella against the green. So I've always seen the strong colors. With my recent film, it was so exciting because I was actually able to do color grading. Mm -hmm. So I worked with Elliot Powell and I, what's so wonderful about it, I was able to tell him, these are the colors I want and you can, I could have the colors move with the emotion of the story, which I was not necessarily able to do with my other films because while I saw a color palette, I couldn't have the color palette change as easily as I wanted to. Mm -hmm. So in Queen Maria, while I don't think in any way it looks manipulative, there I'm so happy with the choices of as the story, it's sadder, more realistic, the colors change and the, and the palette at the end is exactly where I want it for the sunset and for the father saying he doesn't know where the story is going to go, but they're going to try to do the best that they can. And that was a very difficult film for me to end because there is no ending. And the more that I've gotten to know families who raise children with disabilities, and the more that I think about life after COVID, we don't know where it's going to end. And that's okay to end a movie like that. You don't have to end a movie with everything tied up. And I think if there's anything I try to bring to my students, it's that. It doesn't have to end up tied with a bow. We don't need to know everything. But we do need to see some type of transformation. Because I think that that is why we all want to hear stories and see stories. Is we want to see that transformation and change is possible. Wow, that's beautiful. When did you see the acceptance of color grading and color correction expand into documentary as well? Hmm, that's a good question. I saw color grading start to take a big difference in narrative. I would say I could be possibly wrong, but I would say probably 10 years before it was able to go into documentaries. Mm -hmm. But I started to see it in feature documentaries more especially as we trans really transitioned out of film into video, which as those of us who experienced it, it was a huge learning curve because we were like, we can shoot video. Oh my gosh, let's go shoot 60 hours. Let's go shoot 100 hours. We can get whatever we want. And then all of a sudden you start to realize every bit of footage costs money in the editing room. So color grading wasn't even a budgetary cost at that time. It was just trying to figure out how to manage all this footage. And then people are like, let's get an A camera and a B camera. And it was just, it was too much for the editing room. So I think it took simplifying down, how do you make a documentary with editing and make it efficiently, and then begin to see what is possible with mm -hmm. color grading. So when did it become acceptable? I would probably say five to 10 years ago would be about right. When did I, I would say maybe 10 years ago, when did I see people starting to do it? It was while I was making Queen Maria. So I would say in the past six years, it became something that you do as you color grade your documentary. And it's not no longer considered manipulative. Mm -hmm. It's considered a part of creating a piece of art. And that I became very excited about when I was filming because I wasn't, I used four cameras to get to shoot Queen Maria. And my color grade, grader, Elliot Powell, he said he spent a lot of time getting all of those cameras to come together as one. And then he was able to go in and, and subtly grade the way that we discussed it. Yeah, and it looks beautiful. It turned out so well. Talking about creating a piece of art, Grief Becomes Me was shown in a lot of art museums. Um, what was it like to have a film screen in a museum? And did you create it with that location, screening location in mind? 
I created the short films Grief Becomes Me, Gravity, which is also very saturated in a green color, which I wanted. I found it took me a long time to find a huge tree to film underneath it. And I, my goal was I had done film festivals. I had filmed in Cannes and traveled the world with festivals, especially with The Girl Next Door. We'd been in theaters. And I wanted to do something in an art museum. It's a goal. And so I made those short films with that in mind. And the first museum we premiered at was the Long Beach Museum of Art. And it's just really exciting to see your film play in an art museum. It's a different, it's a different experience. They're very short films and they play that people can watch them quickly. Mm -hmm. Breaking into that milieu of being in art shows, I never fully um, persevered because it's not really not persevered, pursued. I never pursued playing my films and film in art galleries or museums because it's, I don't know, it's just not where I, 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 where I want to be. Yeah. But it was fun to do it. I really enjoyed it. You mentioned earlier that a goal of yours was to have one of your movies shown in a movie theater, like an actual movie theater. Can you talk about when you finally achieved that and what that experience was like? since I was probably 16 or 17 and decided this is exactly what I'm doing with my life. I mean, since I was young, I was kind of like in between being a conductor because I loved conducting music and in, in my own living room and um, being in musicals versus writing and directing. When I finally made that decision, soon after that, I decided I wanted to have a movie theater and my film in a movie theater. And I decided that had to be by 30. I was gonna get married at 24, and I was gonna have a movie in the theaters at 30. And when it didn't happen, I was quite disappointed in myself. And I had a talk, I think I was probably around that time at studying at the Beverly Hills Playhouse, and they said, it's, it's, not a matter of, it's not a matter of what year, it's just a matter of getting it done. So I worked towards it, and with a girl next door, the first theater that we played at was a new art on Wilshire Boulevard in Los Angeles. And it was one of the most exciting days of my life. And I remember walking outside and walking around the block and the film was sold out all the way down. And funnily enough, in the line was a film critic I had met when I was going to graduate school at University of Hawaii. And she had said to me, I said, I'm studying to be a director. And she said, oh, women can't be directors. They don't know how to do technical things. And I thought, hmm, that's interesting because I'm the only person in my family who knows how to hook anything up. And I'm always the one who's called, you know, to do the VCR and the remote. And my father is a brilliant mathematician and yet I'm still the one. And it always just stuck in me. It just bugged me. And I think we all kind of in a way need that person who's like, well, that's not going to happen. And I walked outside to see the line around the block and there she was in the line. So I said hello to her. She said, congratulations. And she told me that she was going to start directing her own film. So you just never know where life takes you. Yeah. Wow. Or who you'll inspire. I recently had a student have a naysayer give him a very hard time. And I said, just print that out up and keep that, keep that in your mind because you're gonna prove that person wrong. Have you ever dealt with imposter syndrome in your career? Obviously being a studio exec and a pioneering woman in the industry of film. I mean, as a female filmmaker myself and a young woman in the industry, I definitely feel like I kind of have to go up against that internal battle of imposter syndrome all the time. Is there any advice you have for people like me I constantly have imposter syndrome. It doesn't ever go away. <laughs> I don't know. It's, I think it's so hard for us to believe in ourselves and just to keep going. But I think one of my mottos has been just to put one foot in front of the other. And just to believe in ourselves is so hard, especially as women. And, just to roam amongst the patriarchy of Hollywood 
and academia is so difficult, but we have to support each other. And something that's always been important to me from the moment we started our company, Cafe Sisters, is for the most part, we've only hired women. We have hired some men, but we hire mostly women and I've always mentored women. And that's very important to me. And I think that that in a way helps sustain me that we're moving forward. But sometimes I am always still compare myself to people. Why haven't I done that? Why haven't I done this kind of film? And I've always wanted to go into the war zone. And that's something that I've been very interested about doing. And hopefully someday I will do a film. I'm very fascinated by it with international correspondence. And I often think what would have happened if I had become an international correspondent? It was not a path I ever really went down but I'm so interested in traveling and international politics. And I find that that life is, I don't know if it's the adrenaline rush or what, but I find it's very fascinating. Do you think that background in travel and immersing yourself in different cultures serve as a foundation for you in your filmmaking? Does that still push your interest to explore war zones and places people don't normally want to go? Absolutely. I, when I left, when I packed my backpack, when people were, when I was graduating from Tulane, I was the only, one of the only people I know who were heading off traveling. Most people were buying suits and the Toomey briefcase. And they said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm gonna go travel. I need to travel. Like I really, I grew up living overseas some because my father's a professor. So he would get sabbaticals. So we lived in England, Greece, and Australia. And while those are fairly Western countries, I really just had so much hunger to travel beyond that. So when we were, I graduated and he went to Australia. And so I followed him down there. But after a couple months, I was bored. I read every feminist book there was in the library. And then I said, I need to leave. And I met a woman who owned a sheep farm in New South Wales. And I went and worked for her. And I worked as a chillaroo. And I worked in the shearing shed where women don't work. And then from there, I met a friend and I picked cherries for her family. And then we ended up going to China for three months. And so it just kind of traveled on and on. And when I finally ended up in Hollywood, I did meet people who went straight from college to Hollywood. And people said, well, how did you feel? Did you feel nervous taking that time off? And I ended up really appreciating it. And I think Barbe Schroeder helped me appreciate it that by traveling and having life experience, you have greater stories to tell. So I think that that has always helped me. I also, I think some other piece, good pieces of advice that I always say it's so hard to replicate my career, but it's really not. The secret to my success was I didn't say no. If there was a good opportunity in front of me and I thought that it was safe and, and could help me, then I would say yes. I'm also not a fearful person. I, I directed a travel show, and uh, which was perfect for me. Well, the host didn't really like speaking on camera, and there we were in New Zealand, and she didn't want to do the bungee jump off the second highest bungee jump in the world. So I said, okay, I'll do it, which was crazy. I'm like so afraid of heights. And they left me hanging upside down while they were lowering the camera down on the other rope because they said, well, you can film her jumping from below. And the I just had on like some little gap tennis shoes and like it was starting to slip and I was over a river and I was like, oh my God, I'm gonna like literally, literally just die on my head swinging on, on top of this river. And so finally I started screaming saying, get me down. You have got to lower me into a boat. So they lowered me down into the boat. They got the camera down. I sat in the boat and waited and the woman refused to jump. So they said, all right, well, we're gonna swap you in to look like her. I mean, well, actually I was the one who had to decide how to do it. So uh, I think the fear, uh, oh, being able to overcome fear has helped me a lot. I've been in many situations like that. What's next for you? Obviously, you just finished Queen Maria. It's doing the festival circuit right now really successfully. Uh, are you looking to create another project soon or just take time to mentor some students? 
Well, I'm working on writing a book about the art of interviewing or mastering the interview. I've really enjoyed teaching interviewing. I've just started the past couple of years and kind of looking at all the secrets that I've used here and there and just also I just find it fascinating with the new debut of podcasts too, which I love. And so I'm gonna be working on that. Uh, I have a TV pilot that I wrote that takes place in ancient Rome. And so that's getting some traction. So as always, that's another thing that I learned from being a development executive. It doesn't matter if you're in narrative, it doesn't matter if you're in short stories or novels, documentaries, you should always have a lot of projects going on. And that's what I've tried to teach my students. And it's hard when you have schoolwork because you think, well, I already have a lot of stuff going on. But when you graduate, I think the thing that I did right is I worked during the week and I made films on the weekend. So I've always been a hard worker and I've always had a lot going on creatively. Mm -hmm. And then I have a passion project of mine that I have found a box of love letters from my 20s. So I'm trying to figure out how to organize those into a book. Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. One last question for anyone who's watching this and thinking, I want to be where Christine is in her career. Do you have any last words of advice? My last words of advice would be to learn how to listen and don't say no and try to be as fearless as possible. That was awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. It was so great having you. Thank you for having me. Thank you.